hello everyone welcome to my youtube channel today we are going to be looking at some questions they usually ask in microbiology and i'll try to provide answers where possible okay now uh, before we continue my name is dr emmanuel obodo i'm a biomedical scientist and i'm also a lecturer in biomedical science here in the united kingdom our first question today is going to be to explain hazard and protective mechanism of level 3 laboratory so this is like a quest three questions in one first explain hazard two protective mechanism then three of level 3 laboratory so we first of all need to know what actually is a level 3 laboratory so just in a nutshell level 3 laboratory is just a laboratory where we work with the microorganisms that are potentially can cause a serious damage okay you know or diseases so what we do in such laboratory is just to make sure we, we provide some guidelines and you know design some approaches to work that can help to ensure there is safety within the laboratory now having no what level 3 laboratory means let us look at what exactly is the hazard we can see in level 3 laboratory because now we know that in this level 3 laboratory we have a number of deaths we work with pathogens so obviously pathogen is going to be one of them exposure to pathogen is a problem okay so here we can be exposed with high risk pathogens like mycobacterium as the case may be like influenza and so on so that exposure is a hazard that can be associated with level 3 laboratory now, obviously, because of that, there can be if they are aerosols. Most of these organisms are aerosols. You can find them in the air. I mean, if someone can breathe it in, and that can cause a problem. So that is also another hazard. I hope that makes sense. And this can occur maybe during centrifugation, during pipetting, during handling of the uh, during handling of the infectious materials. It can generate this. It can generate aerosols, meaning that this organism can you know potentially be seen in the air, and that can be held, and that can cause problems. And because of this, their aerosol uh, characteristics, it means that it can easily contaminate surface areas, both the equipment, both the PPE, okay, the personal protective equipment. Every, you know, uh, every substances or every materials used in, the lab in that laboratory are likely to be contaminated. So, contaminated surface area is one of the hazards associated with level 3 at laboratory. Another thing is the needle stick injury. So, someone, because in the laboratory we use uh, sharp objects in working. So, what it means that if they if the sharp object accidentally pierce anyone okay or puncture anyone that can introduce the very aerosols these pathogens into that very person and that can cause a problem and another thing is the spillage and splashes obviously if there is accidental spillage or splashes that will again contaminate the areas and of course that makes it even more dangerous so that is one of the uh, uh, hazards associated with level 3 uh, laboratory now let's continue so when we look at this very level 3 laboratory we'll look at the what it means level 3 laboratory is a laboratory that uh, we work with pathogens okay uh, pathogen that can have the potential to cause serious damage to the system but because that laboratory has such characteristics we design method of working to ensure that there is safety so we'll look at the hazard that can be associated with it now what want to look at how can we then protect ourselves from that very hazard what are the protective mechanisms we can use to ensure that this very hazard associated with level 3 doesn't really affect the personnel where possible or the even the environment or, or the equipment as the case may be. Number one, in this very laboratory, we use what we call biosafety cabinet. So we use safety cabinet. And what would the safety cabinet do? So what it does that it provides a sterile working environment by filtering air through what we call high efficiency particulate air. So what it's going to do is that it kind of controls that very microorganisms, you know, through the air. The air that is coming, the aerosols are controlled, are confined into an environment. That kind of restricts it and makes sure that it doesn't spread all over the lab. Does that make sense? Okay. So that is very, very important. And that reduces the exposure of the very uh, aerosols or pathogens to the uh, environment. Uh, because if that is not done, it obviously is going to make the environment more polluted. And of course, people are likely to get sick because they are going to inhale it. Now, another thing we're going to look at here is in terms of personal protective equipment. So we we'll make sure we wear our lab coat and hand glove and of course eye protection, obviously, where possible. This helps to protect us from this very uh, pathogen and aerosols. And again, you look at we also wear what we call respirators, like things like NF. Uh, N95 masks. Basically, you wear the mask where you can be able to breathe through, and this very mask where you can breathe through can then trap any of these very particles, and that way it cannot get into your system. So these are the ways we have. We these are some mechanisms that we use to be able to control these very aerosols, to control these very uh, pathogens. Okay. 
Now, we now look at engineering control, okay? And that is what we call like this, like negative pressure. So in this very negative pressure, what we do here is that, you know, in level three, we can maintain this very through under a uh, negative air pressure relative to adjacent area. So this kind of ensure that the airborne contaminants are contained within the laboratory. So every airborne, con the aerosols, the, the contamination of the air are controlled within the laboratory. It doesn't go outside the laboratory. That way we can also you know, protect the environment, not to carry what that happens in the laboratory to outside the uh, laboratory. So that is what we call negative uh, pressure. I hope that makes sense. Now, like I've also explained before, things like HEPA filtration also help to provide ventilation through filters and that help to remove these very infectious particles from the air before it goes outside the laboratory. I hope that very makes sense, okay? So it helps to control that very infectious particles, you know, as within the laboratory, doesn't allow it to go outside the laboratory and that is HEPA filters. Another aspect of this is administrative control and that is where training and SOP comes in. So anybody that works in that laboratory must be properly trained and the person must be trained as, as prescribed in the, uh, the standard operating procedure of that very laboratory. Because without effective training, without effective education, even without the SOP, if people are to work without this very training, it will even expose that very environment more to this very aerosols, to this very pathogen spreading as the case may be. And that is why it is important that people are properly trained there is SOP to work with. That will help to minimize the risk. Now, there's also another thing like access control. It's not everybody that are allowed to come to that very laboratory. People who are allowed to come to the laboratory, inside that level 3 laboratory, are the ones who are authorized. In most cases, they are mainly the staff because we don't want an outsider coming into the lab who doesn't have the kind of training that we have got being exposed to the very aerosols which could affect them. So anyway, access you know, is controlled to and restricted to only the authorized person. I hope that makes sense. Now we look at work practices. So, of course, uh, we, it involves good microbiology techniques, making sure that, you know, of course, and that follow up from the training. So, with the effective training, then we cannot know how we can handle the, the samples. We know how to handle the samples, okay, to make sure that we minimize these very aerosols being generated. So, effective techniques in this very laboratory, in this microbiology. Uh, laboratory is very, very is a key is a vital aspect of controlling these very pathogens so because if someone is not properly trained the techniques can be affected and because of the techniques can be, is affected that can even enhance this very aerosol generation but once someone is properly trained making the person to be able to effectively apply good microbiological techniques that can help to minimize these very aerosols another thing is the, the contamination obviously in this kind of laboratory it may be if not impossible not to uh, not to, for the environment not to be contaminated but what we can do is to continually decontaminate the environment okay maybe regularly uh, decontaminating the equipment okay and disposal of contaminated material using what autoclave or maybe a uh, chemical disinfectant okay so we can use disinfectant occasionally to clean the um, the equipment okay we can also autoclave some of our materials where possible okay and that can help to be able to killed and destroyed this very aerosols or pathogen or decontaminate this very aerosols and pathogen and that way it can keep both the personnel and also keep the environment safe and of course um, that way we now make sure that that very aerosol has been contained. I hope that makes sense. Now, another aspect of this in making sure, because remember in pathology laboratory, there's always going to be an emergency. So, in the SOP, there has to be a documented procedure on how to respond in the case of emergency, such as spillage. Okay, so once there's a spillage, we now have a protocol in place. There has to be a protocol in place on how that can be responded to. And obviously, if during that very accident and someone has been exposed to the very aerosols, okay, if there's an accidental exposure to the very aerosols, there has to be a procedure again in place on how that is incident can be handled. So, protocol for immediate medical evaluation of and treatment in a case of accidental exposure is very, very important. I hope that makes sense. So, these two talk about the emergency procedure. We need to know what to do in a case of emergency. Okay? So, let's look at question number two. What will you do if you are working with serological analyzer and HIV 
equivocal result is obtained. So if you obtain HIV equivocal result, that means ambiguous result, you are unable to actually say what you can. You know, you are not very, you don't have confidence to be able to interpret that result. So that is what it means. What are you going to do? Number one, what you do is to verify that very result. Okay, you verify the result through rerunning the test. So you go to rerun the test. Rerunning the test can help you to be able to make sure that the result you are obtaining, you know, is accurate. Okay, it can help you to rule out any technical error or maybe anomalies okay with serological analyzers does that make sense so rerunning the test is very very important again because it is important as well it is important that we also check the possibility of potential errors okay because you need to rule out those very errors and in such situation we can look at the sample is there anything wrong with the sample maybe things like labeling contamination like mislabeling as the case may be if there is anything wrong with it obviously that has made you to uh, you know solve that problem but obviously if you don't find that you might need to continue to review any other processes like you can look at your analyzer is the analyzer working the way it's supposed to work that this is where you cannot look at something like maintenance record calibration method and obviously if you think that there is any lack there is a kind of no conformities in this along this line you then have to carry out the maintenance and calibration then repeat the test I hope Hope that makes sense so because what you are doing now is to investigate after you have checked that there is nothing wrong with the sample you then need to check what could that be the problem is it the equipment as the case may be okay now the next thing you can now do is what to call follow up laboratory protocol so remember that once such a result is obtained in the laboratory, your SOP should be able to contain information on how you can be able to, you know, handle such a equivocal kind of result. So once you get an ambiguous result, your SOP should be able to tell you how to deal with it. Does that make sense? So what you need to do is to refer to your SOP and follow the guideline given to you in the SOP on how to be able to deal with such an ambiguous or equivocal result. I hope that makes sense. Because that will help you to know the actions to follow. Your SOP should tell you what to do once you get equivocal results. And one of the things it's going to tell you is the action you have to take. And one of these actions could include things like uh, additional testing. Okay, there might be a need for additional testing, and that is where repeating the HIV test on the new sample comes in. So you might need to ask for a repeat. You can ask them to send you another sample. This can help us to make sure that the result we obt obtain, okay, is accurate and reliable. I hope that makes sense. Now, another thing we can do is to look at alternative or confirmatory tests. So if we have done the test, okay, using the analyzer, obviously depending on what the result is like is not ambiguous we don't really know we might need to confirm the test we might need to use alternative method to be able to see if we can get a result that is different from what we already have or maybe something that can confirm what we already have and that is where things like western blood comes in okay maybe uh, something like hiv differentiation immunoacid comes in or nucleic acid application test also comes in this can help you to be able to confirm the result that you have gotten Right, so another thing we can do is then consult with your supervisors. If you, if you notice that there is equivocal HIV result, you need to consult with your supervisors, consult with your, you know, of course, your seniors, okay? Anyone that is higher than you, you might in, in position, you might need to find out their own opinion about that very uh, result that you have gotten, okay? So seek a guidance, that's what I'm trying to say. Seek a guidance. If you seek a guidance, that can really help you, obviously, to know even the best step and actions that you might need to take. I hope that makes sense. Another thing then that after we have taken this step, it is important that we communicate each of these steps that we've taken, okay, to the clinician. So the people who are providing the health care, you know, to the patient, it's important we communicate what we have obtained, the results we have obtained, and what we have done. Now, that will help them to be able to know how to manage that very patient, okay? So that will then help them to be able to, you know, of course, once we report that very equivocal result, it cannot help the clinicians because we've informed them, we've let them know that see the results we have obtained. Okay, once we've reported it by telling them, by giving them the information of what has happened, it can help them to know how to manage that very patient. And of course, you can then recommend to them, and this is where you can tell them, okay, maybe we can repeat this test maybe in two days' time, in a week's time, as the case may be. So after you've informed them what has happened, you can also recommend to them maybe the next course of action that might need to be taken. I hope that makes sense. 
Now, that cannot lead to documentation of all the actions taken. So it is important we document every action that has been taken because that can help us to keep our, to have accurate record keeping. And this can help to ensure that we trace what has happened. And of course, it can help us to, it can make the laboratory to give account of what has happened in the past, okay? I hope that makes sense. So documentation of all that has happened, what has happened, the action that you have taken, okay, is very, very important, okay? And of course, this is where, obviously, follow after we've communicated to the clinicians, of course, there can be a patient counseling and follow-up. I don't think this is for uh, biomedical scientists. This is where the clinician comes in. But it is from the information that you are giving to them that can actually help them to effectively carry out the very uh, phase of um, patient management very well. I hope that makes sense. So they can inform the patient, of course, the possibility of confirmatory Entry results are available, okay? So once we have repeated the test, okay, and we have found that, okay, this is what it is, if it is positive, obviously, then this clinician can then be able to uh, cancel the patient, you know, um, let the patient know the result and, you know, provide the person a counseling that can help the patient to be able to manage, you know, the information very, very well. And of course, obviously, arrange a follow-up test, yeah, of course, if needed, meaning that if required, okay, we can, they can also arrange for a follow-up uh, test if needed but this is obviously is not for biomedical scientists our own is to relate what has happened and give them information and ask them to repeat where appropriate now they cannot be able to that information cannot help them to be able to manage their patient very well by telling them the result and also telling them uh, where possible when we can be able to repeat the test i hope that makes sense yeah thank you for listening i hope you enjoyed the video please do let me know what you think about the video can I ask you to uh, subscribe, share, like, and comment? Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best. Till I come back away again. Bye bye.